I've been hoping to talk about this for a long time. Uh, this is a uh, really like a long-term bit of work for a lot of us. Um, the, um, the consensus lab in general has been um, pioneering a ton of like amazing contributions to the ecosystem in terms of scaling in a bunch of different ways. And this one I think is gonna be one of the greatest contributions that um, this lab is going to make um, to the whole blockchain space and to, I think beyond that, um, this might actually be a protocol that ends up coming to sort of the mainstream and data centers and so on outside of a blockchain context um, because it gives you Byzantine fault tolerant, tolerance in a um, very nice scalable setting and it has very nice properties uh, for a lot of classic distributed systems applications as so you can think of doing cluster management and large scale computational arrangements and so on um, with much stronger security than um, you know, traditional consensus protocols. So first of all, I wanna talk about something I call the interplanetary principle. Um, this was something that we, the IPFS community came up with in 2014-15, after the, we wrote the initial paper, so we never made it in there, but th we should write a paper about this. Um, so first off, like, Web3 needs to become web scale. Today, Web3 is not at all web scale. When you think about the traditional Web2 workloads, um, you require massive scale of um, uh, bandwidth utilization and massive scale transactional throughputs and so on, right? So um, this is partly why Bitcoin was, uh, and Ethereum and so on, were sort of like disregarded by the traditional uh, cloud people because it just kind of seemed crazy that you know, a, a transactional system that could do only a fraction of what your phone could do was gonna run the entire monetary system and so on, right? And so that's why like, it was sort of disregarded. Uh, however, they sort of like missed the point, and the point is to get into this um, much better model of permissionless, large-scale, Byzantine fault-tolerant networks that have an economic construction uh, within them. Um, it's a much uh, stronger way of building um, distributed systems and applications, but we need to make them scale. We need to use the lear learnings from the distributed systems world to scale these things. Uh, so that's our target. Like We really mean to be able to run all of those kinds of things. Um, over these systems. And I know that sounds crazy, but uh, you'll see. Uh, like, you'll see over the next few years. Now, um, there's this consensus bottleneck where uh, you're trying to push in tons of amounts of, of transactions, you, everything is getting bottlenecks, so we wanna be able to scale it. I think everyone here is pretty familiar with that. Um, let's talk about the internet for a moment. So one of the key things here is that the internet is partition, um, the partitions happen all the time, and so your systems have to be partition tolerant. Today, applications and blockchains are not at all partition tolerant. If you lose connectivity to the, to the mothership, in a sense, you're, you're host. Um, things don't work well. However, the internet requires partition tolerance because things will break apart. Like, it's a huge grapevine with lots of different um, construct, uh, pieces and so on, and things come up and down all the time. So you cannot run a mission-critical application at all touching a blockchain because they're not partition tolerant. Now, where, uh, so think of like the, this set of properties, I think you already saw a bunch of these. Um, this is kind of what we're shooting for, like billions of transactions per second or trillions, of course, parallelized across a large scale uh, with fast local finality. So um, I'm pretty serious about these numbers. Like, um, sure, you have like the root level consensus in, in Earth scale. Uh, that could be, you know, three to five seconds or something like that. Uh, you know, that's kind of like pushing it. Maybe you could get faster. Um, but then you want to be able to drop down to city level or region level in like 100 milliseconds or lower and then get to, you know, around one millisecond inside of a data center should be doable. One, two, five milliseconds. Um, and that, that is something that I think these networks will be able to do. Uh, it's a bunch of work to get there, but um, with the subnet structure, you can do that. And so what happens when you are able to have the traditional security properties of a blockchain and smart contracts when you're running at millisecond level loops? Like, that's what we're talking about. And that's what the, the promise and potential of this. Um, and th also think of the throughput, like millisecond loops plus trillions of transactions per second. We're talking about a massive scale um, uh, operation, right? We also want uh, all of this to be uh, safe in the traditional blockchain uh, ways against you know, nation state attackers. We need, there's a bunch of parameters that need to be tunable for applications because different applications have different requirements. Um, we want horizontal scalability of being able to meet demand um, over time, like as new applications appear. Um, and you need to also be able to deal with different nations have different, having different policy structures or different applications having different policy structures. You want to be able to evolve the network in pieces without forcing the rest of the world to, uh, to conform. 
Uh, you, of course, then you know, want, want other traditional things that the blockchain world wants, like encryption transactions and so on. Uh, so that's some of the thinking that we had. Um, so now, IPC is a hierarchical consensus, which is hierarchical consensus this is a more broad idea, um, which is saying, let's take consensus protocols and scale them by organizing them into a structure where you couple them and you derive some proper, like the children, derive some properties from the parent. Um, this doesn't have to be a tree, um, though I have not written any paper about this. Um, you could probably c construct like DAGs here, so that it doesn't actually necessarily need to be a tree. And there's probably some extension to this where you don't even have directions here. You could have like mesh meshes of of consensus protocols, and then that lands you closer to like the um, you know this kind of like peering structure. Uh, but that's I think way harder to get working right. So the hierarchy really helps in the traditional distributed systems way. Hierarchy makes things a lot simpler. So um, IPC is going to do this kind of thing, but it's going to do it. Um, in, in, a, in a way that uh, like couples with the, with, the, with the blockchain model of, of enhancing security um, of the children based on the security of the parent, um, and you want to be able to move around assets, and, and so you, you want like very strong guarantees um, uh, there. So like if you were doing something simpler, you could have a much simpler protocol if you were just kind of like trying to do like um, you know log machine replication or something like that, or um, having eventually consistent structures and whatnot. Like if you want to be able to like have hard security. Um, that's a much harder problem. Now let's talk about the interplanetary principle. It's something that uh, the IPFS community came up with, and the idea is like, um, you know, if you remember the end-to-end -end principle, that like, says that inside networks, um, you want to keep things dumb and stateless. The endpoints have to do all the work because there's kind of like this negative result where like you can't possibly, even if the network is really really smart, you can't do everything there. So there's kind of a, an end-to-end -end principle of saying you have to do the keep the smarts at the edges always. So you might as well um, make things really simple in the beginning, in, in the middle. So in, in kind of this traditional networking style of having these principles for design, um, the interplanetary principle points out uh, that when you deal with like large scale delays, and, and this is why it's interplanetary, uh, because for us humans, it's really easy to think about minutes and seconds. We don't have a good appreciation for milliseconds, microseconds, and nanoseconds. Our computers operate with very different degrees there, uh, but we just have no intuition for it. So it's much easier to think about this in terms of uh, planetary level delays. Imagine that you were trying to load a web page from Mars, and like every single time you clicked, you had to wait, you know, four to 24 minutes, depending on where are you in the, in the world. Uh, sorry, I end to end principle. Uh, imagine that you, you, um, you had to wait four to 24 minutes um, before you got any, you know, the click got any feedback. And, and so you had to like send something out and wait, wait a while before, before it came back. Uh, instead, you should be building system to be delay tolerant um, and to be able to move around the content and the structures to locally and so pay the expensive cost once, move all the state that you possibly need, and then compute locally and try, and try to minimize the use, of, the use of, of, of links like this. Now, if you take the interplanetary principle and shrink it down to our, this room and the cloud and so on and the computer and uh, these computers and the you know, um, cache and RAM and so on, you end up with the exact same ideas and by the way, with bigger orders of magnitude, <laughs> Uh, the orders of magnitude here are bigger than like the planet to Earth and so on. The, the, the difference is, um, but the principle stays, which is you want to be able to minimize the round trips between uh, all kinds of communications. So you know, if, if here we were the traditional IP, this, the reason this came up from IPFS is that um, if you are trying to load a, a web page or have a chat application and so on, if, if all of us in this room were, were editing a Google Doc together or trying to send some slides from one computer to another, it would be really great to go from this physical device here to that device over there type, 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 and so on, without ever having to go to the cloud, and de dealing with kind of um, the potential partitions, delays, and so on. Imagine editing a Google Doc with 24-minute delays, right? Like you'd go, um, you'd go crazy. Um, so um, the interplan so design distributed applications with tolerance for interplanetary delays. If you do that, if you force yourself to account for that, and be extremely careful with where you introduce the delays, you produce much better designs, you produce partition-tolerant designs, that will behave dramatically better in Earth's internet because Earth's inter internet has these planetary scale delays from the perspective of computers, not from the perspective of most humans. Now, not all humans, there are many humans that are behind extremely slow networks for whom these delays are awful. Like you, you have page loads from certain parts of the internet, especially in you know, really poor connectivity regions, where you're talking about like you know, 30 second to minute long delays before like a page will load. Um, just go to a super crowded um, you know, conference place and so on and try to load a page. It's like super, super slow. 
Now, if you do this right, then this will lead to local first applications that will sync to the cloud second. And this is the same kind of principle that we're using in, in IPC. This will yield support for mission critical applications. You'll be able to do, mission critical here means something where like you can run an emergency service over, like messaging that is reliable and robust and will, will keep operating even if something else in the world falls apart. And it will also fit you know, mobile and so on and you know, poor connectivity regions much better. So design with the interplanetary principle. But by the way, we do are serious about this and we are going in, into these, these places. So think of like these kinds of networks. And um, you know, have it report that this is how we can actually go to the moon. <laughs> like, you can actually have the first blockchain systems that can actually go to the moon by leaning, leaning on these kinds of, kinds of systems. So think of you know, something like, yeah, sorry, just flipping slides in different places. So we are serious about going into these places. So you, know, you can actually go to the moon. Um, so imagine a, an environment like this, but think of like all these kinds of nodes and so on, and they should be computing locally, and you should be able to store and retrieve files there, and never have to clear a transaction over to Earth, right? Like that, it was sort of crazy to have to have to go do that. So let's go talk about applications. So I'm, I'm going to elide the entire design because you just heard about that, and like that, um, that was the entire uh, presentation of how, how how do we build this. I just kind of wanted to give you kind of the intuition for the design and why the design works that way, so that you can start thinking about the applications. So, um, you know, traditional consensus, um, well, first off, uh, large-scale Web3 um, applications can be made possible through that transactional throughput that I was describing. If you can do that at those scales with those latencies, you can actually start building these kinds of things. Um, you can also start building much better bridges and composability to other, to other networks because you can create subnets that operate with the, that co-locate with all those other networks and can move state between them without having to like, deal with extremely expensive, potentially extremely expensive and difficult cross L1 environments. So you could have a much faster, smaller chain that couples to one, you move state into that one, then you go over to the other one and you move uh, state to the other, the other place. And so you can have those kinds of uh, con connectivity and bridges. Now that would require linking to something else, not as a parent, but as some other, some other kind of um, property. So now there's a bunch of traditional consensus applications like cluster management and so on that I was describing that you can now do in a Byzantine setting out of, you know, out of using IPC. So you know, think of like networks like this that are like really massive and so on. Now imagine there's a bunch of different computers run by different people or applications run by different people. You want to be able to transact really fast. Think of high frequency trading and stuff like that. You can now do that in, in this kind of uh, setting with hard consensus guarantees. Um, now you can, I claim that you could do traditional backends in a Web3 sort of sense um, with optimistic or zero knowledge proof based verifiability, which might be, ver CK verifiability would be a bit expensive, but you, you make it up in the scale out. So, by being able to fan out and have so many computers, you can pay off a few orders of magnitude in running a traditional standard web app backend in the zero knowledge setting. Um, and you then get the, the ability to kind of run tons of these because you don't have to uh, compute in all of them. Uh, and the way you do that is you run subnets of these. So you can also do um, these kind of regional blockchain applications. So think about money. You want to be able to spend money in different places. You want to be able to uh, use a financial contract in a particular environment. You want to be able to kind of travel to localities. And you want all of that to work whether the internet is operating or not. If you have ever tried to pay for food with Bitcoin, you will experience an amazing thing called the block time delay. And you will be there trying to pay for your thing for 10, 20, Potentially 50 minutes if the other person doesn't trust you and has read the papers, but in reality, you know, most people like actually just see the transaction going through and so on, and it's super super slow. Now, if you instead compare that to a transaction from a mobile phone, you know, you tap it and you're done and you leave. That's what we need. We need to get to that level of, of operation. But in order to do that, you need very high throughput chains with local clearing times, um, and so that should be able to operate in that locality. And by the way, you should be able to work on a plane, so you should be able to be in a plane and have that kind of, um, you know, be disconnected from the rest of the world and have that type of transaction happen without you have it, um, needing, requiring connectivity and, and so on. So suddenly, all of the smart contract potential becomes possible in those, uh, in those environments. And by the way, one of the things that has held back a lot of the financial instrument adoption that, uh, from blockchains is that you end up in this setting where it's really useful for a lot of environments, but the kind of like more modern economies don't need them as much because the financial infrastructure works pretty well, but the countries where the financial infrastructure sucks have terrible connectivity. 
And then, but they can't use blockchains because like, you know, you just can't even load the web pages, let alone like try to do a transaction for 30 minutes, right? And so potentially these things could be extremely useful to be able to do um, local connectivity settings and, and bi build a better financial stack in those places. So you could do things like the remittances use cases and the, um, you know, local money and mobile money and so on uh, much better. So yeah, I already talked about partition tolerant mission critical applications. Uh, one interesting one for that you might, um, uh, don't know about is that Fathom is, gonna, is building a CDN, uh, and the way that we're doing it is th we're thinking about regions. We're going to be separating out a lot of um, nodes and so on, assigning regions, and think of those as subnets. So think of those um, structures as being able to um, map to a specific subnet, and that subnet is in a particular region of the world, and you're able to kind of assign nodes to those, those environments and be able to transact uh, from there to, to, um, to the peers. Uh, so you know, think of this kind of structure here where you have like a bunch of retrieval clients somewhere in the world. They want very low latency retrieval. They interact directly with some node. That, of course, doesn't go over the chain. But the cluster management of what are those nodes that are serving that data and what data should they store, all of that coordination, all of that traditional cluster management can be done in a subnet of IPC um, in that region. And it becomes partition tolerant. You no longer have to interact with the rest of the world. The connectivity to the rest of the world falls apart, no problem. You can still load your web page. You can still like, find out how to go to like, a hospital because like, the pages still load. Um, uh, another one I think you heard about already today is compute over data, uh, where you know, we're building out a, a set of networks around um, different types of uh, different types of primitives to achieve verifiability and privacy will give you um, different compute, decentralized compute networks, and these could all be L2 networks that sort of couple to a couple to Falcon, a couple to some other network. Um, and IPC can be an extremely useful way to be able to interface between all of these because it gives you a really nice way of like bridging and moving around state between these, um, even if you sort of build them separately. And the reason why you build these separately is because um, this triangle is like a really punishing triangle. If you've ever tried to think about how do you do um, you know, try to do like what, what Falcon does, but like try to do it for just general computation like lambdas or EC2 or something like that. Actually trying to do decentralize any kind of computation, you end up in this environment where you have to add verifiability because you need to certify that something is done correctly, and you have to add privacy, meaning like the data should be, should be not readable by the person that's computing. Uh, if you want to use cryptographic methods for this, it's extremely expensive. If you add verifiability, it's super expensive. You add privacy, way more expensive. So you end up in this environment where you know, the centralized cloud can be high performance, performance and everything else kind of sucks. Um, however, there are still many applications where you want to do this, but only in those applications. You don't want to do it for everything. So this is going to create an environment where we're going to have many different um, computational networks based on different cryptographic approaches. Zero knowledge compute networks will be si different from fully homomorphic encryption networks, which will be different from multi-party computation networks, and so on. And what we need to do is enable those different blockchain networks to interface together really, really well. And so if, we, you know, if you do that well, you can actually get to massive scale data science, um, all of this sort of coordinated, and think of all the data pipelines um, uh, built with IPC. And you know, really kind of the kind of target use case that I've been working with the consensus lab team on is like actually be able to run entire virtual worlds. Like actually put in a game like Minecraft. Um, I think this isn't normally a GIF, but a PDF doesn't support GIF yet, so uh, won't be able to see the GIF. But imagine being able to have an entire virtual world like Minecraft uh, and all of the interactions of the players in that uh, speed being able to be tracked with the hard verifiability of, um, of consensus in a blockchain setting. So like that's where we're headed. So being able to do this kind of um, massive scale computation, not just for one virtual world, but for all of the shards of the world that all the players want to play, right? So if anybody has worked on game design, you end up in an environment where you have to create tons of different servers because people want to play with different subsets and all that kind of stuff. So you, you're able to create those kinds of environments. And like that's what we're shooting for. Uh, cool. Hopefully this was uh, a good summary of IPC applications. Again, sorry for being um, late and so on and uh, for messing up with the slides. But great. Uh, any questions? You were saying that uh, the internet ar architecture, uh, back, back, back. Yeah, you can keep it, it has some partition uh, problems, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there, you, you cannot, like, th this is the real way that the internet is shaped, right? And so yeah. a bunch of times, these links are going to break. Yes, yes, of course. 
uh, the thing is, mo most of the systems that we are creating at the moment are based on the application layer. Uh, and that is more like the how the computers are, the ASs are connected physically and uh, some protocols around that. At yeah, yeah, so, so imagine writing a consensus protocol where like the ASs and BGP could be negotiated in a crypto setting, yes. but you need to be able to operate where the connectivity itself is changed by, by the rules that you're deciding, right? Like the, the, the question <laughs> is exactly that. So uh, at which level, at which layer do you think we can create protocols that effectively uh, break those, those problems? Well, so what, what I would say is like, um, we, we probably need one consensus layer for all of the solar system, one consensus layer underneath that for like the inner planets. This is a latencies argument. One for Earth, one for Mars, and so on. Um, you know, th this, this kind of setting. Uh, and then once you are in within Earth, then you land in layers like these where you kind of want one layer for like the regions, like the AWS and Google Cloud and so on, the, the decisions around the regions there are like really good. You don't need to fight those. Um, one for that, and then one layer for the data center specifically. So you want to go to a specific data center and have one layer there. So you know it's kind of like four, five or six layers. Uh, and so, however, you don't have to start at the top. You can actually start with the Earth one, and then later create a new route and kind of migrate and so on. Um, or like you know take the route and then like slow it down, change the block time, slow it down, move it up into space. And then you know keep going from there. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Thank cool. You. So it really means interplanetary. <laughs> so just so we're clear. Any other question? Oh yeah, over here. Thanks, Juan. Uh, real quick. So does um, it sounds like this uh, breaks cap theorem? because you have both consistency and availability. No, so you don't have full availability across the entire network. So um, this is partition tolerant, which means uh, you're gonna have one partition with consistency in that partition. Then you have another partition with or another consensus subnet with consistency in that region. Now you cannot transact on the other sides when you don't have connectivity. In order to do that, as uh, Alfonso was explaining, you have to like do these transactions across. So what, basically the idea, the insight is you say, Hey, like putting consensus, putting everyone in the same consensus protocol doesn't make sense. What you should do is like ahead of time move the state where you want to transact it, then transact it really fast, then move it somewhere else. This is like traditional computer science engineering point. It's like, hey, you want to edit data really fast, move it from the rest of the world into your disk, from your disk into your RAM, from your RAM into your L3, L2, L1 cache, and then you know feed it into the CPU and like, keep operating and just move things around depending on like. When, like how fast you want to go. And so the point is like if you want to go fast with partition tolerance, like move the state in there, right? Like you have some files in your computer because you have to operate disconnected from the internet. Same way, like move some of your smart contracts and some of the state into a subnet, then you can operate. But it doesn't break, so, so cap still applies because you only get consistency there. You have to wait until like you connect to the rest of the group to then have full consistency and full view of, of the entire world. So that means you keep you know, most super valuable assets on the safest consensus all the way up at the top. Um, and then you move only the stuff that you want to transact fast into those lower, lower spots. So would there be eventual consistency across the hierarchy then? Yeah, but it's, it's hard consistency locally. You eventually get consistency, but, but I, I, let's not use that term because eventual consistency allows like different versions and it's like a sloppy system by design. That's not, this is not sloppy. This is when, when the system returns, you're gonna get the results. You're gonna get the results after a while. So it's like a delayed, it's, it's it, like, yeah. So th from, from the phrasing, it is eventual consistency, but the traditional literature of eventual consistency is sloppy uh, or uses sloppiness. Um, this does not use sloppiness. You don't get like two values. You only get one. If you get two values as a slashable consensus condition and you like wreck them, so. so not, not, too, not too hard. <laughs> All right, cool, thank you. There's one last question there, I think, since it was already asked. Yes, so well. uh, it's a quick question. How do you prevent excessive centralization at the lower levels of this hierarchy? So like at the, at the root? At the bottom. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's easy to be cheap if you're you know, super centralized, right? Oh, um, but that might be fine. Like you, you, can, you can bound the, 
th think of that area as like a bounded security layer with like a bounded economy, and you like you go in and move your your contracts and assets in there if you're willing to sort of play by those rules, and you just don't move all your value, right? Like when you when you go out in the middle of the night, you're not carrying all of your assets with you, and so you're carrying some assets, and that's fine. Like if you get mugged or something, you lose some money, but like you don't lose everything. Well, so it's, you it's don't okay to be centralized at the bottom, but you. It's not that it's, a, it's, it's rather that like the context is different, so you should choose whatever makes sense. So you might still not want to be centralized. If you're running a high frequency exchange, you don't want to be, there you are going to be moving massive amounts of money, like billions to tens of billions of dollars being tr transacted really fast. Um, and so you want very hard guarantees there and you don't want centralization, but you want to be really fast. There what you do is you, you choose that because you want to go really fast, and so you move into a data center, you remove the ability to talk to everyone else in the world because everyone like it's too slow. The speed of light is a problem, um, and that's okay. So, but that's a decentral. You still need that decentralization in there. And by the way, zero knowledge helps here because if you make everything verifiable, uh, in, in sort of like a second step, you then get super nice guarantees. Gotcha. You get like the the, the L two rollups level guarantees, which is pretty cool. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you All so right. much, Mark.